speaker back. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so now, uh, so it's a pleasure to have you know, uh, Gus Hart from CIU uh, uh, to give today's colloquium. So I really appreciate you know, uh, Gus has got to come back. Uh, well, I, I also want to take this opportunity to, uh, opportunity to thank Gus for being so flexible with me on rescheduling the talk. You know, in fact, you know, the original speaker for today you know, had an uh, unexpected sickness and uh, Gus agreed to come back earlier. Uh, Gus got his uh, PhD from UC Davis and uh, he worked at the, the National Renewable Energy Lab and before he joined the, the faculty uh, uh, member at BYU, he was a faculty member at uh, Northern Arizona. Uh, university. Uh, Gus' research uh, focuses on like com computational material science, uh, including like alloy uh, modeling and thermodynamic simulations and uh, lattice configuration uh, in the variation. So today it's going to tell us about uh, uh, how to use uh, compressive sensing to build a physical model. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here. And I don't remember who was originally scheduled today, but I'm not them. And so if you came for that talk, uh, I'll try to make sure that you're not disappointed. Um, so I'm going to talk, um, in the latter half of my talk, I'm going to talk about this new idea from signal processing called compressive sensing. But the first half of the talk is going to be kind of general and talk about computational material science and the big ideas. And um, so I hope that it's a good bird's eye view rather than, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on a whole bunch of nitty-gritty nitty details. I want to give um, kind of a general overview. So um, with that, I'm going to say, instead of sitting there like that, if you have a question or I keep saying some jargon over and over again, like everybody in the room should know it, but you don't, that probably means that I'm the only one that knows it and that everybody else is afraid to ask. So I'm going to make a special request here that you interrupt me. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Interrupt me as we go. Um, if I have to skip a bunch of slides or something, I'm totally happy to do that. If we got to the end of the talk and we'd had a lot of questions and there aren't any at the end, that'd be fine too. Okay? So please feel free to interrupt me. Um, I, I, I tend to talk kind of fast. So I'll try to take deep breaths, and every time I take a deep breath, you interrupt me, okay, if you have a question. So if I'm talking fast, it doesn't mean that I, I don't want to be interrupted. It means that I'm super excited about what I'm telling you about, okay? Um, okay, so I'm a kind of a materials physicist. Uh, I've kind of slipped into that um, over the years. And in the materials world right now, in, uh, you know, making, so think, let, let's do a detour for just a Sometimes we don't realize how important materials are in our everyday life, but you've got a cell phone in your pocket. It's got a lithium-ion battery. From conception to commercialization, that was about a 30-year uh, project. Um, every time you, you know, land in an airplane, you've got um, a high-strength steel in the landing gear. That was about a 30-year project to take that from conception to commercialization. Uh, the Teflon on your non-stick frying pan you cooked your eggs in this morning, that was about a 10, a 20 year uh, development from, you know, from concept when they first discovered the material, the commercialization. So um, materials really drive, think about silicon, right, and, and all the things that we do with silicon and solid state lasers and these things. Materials really drive the technological revolutions of our society. And materials are really the bottleneck for a lot of the problems that we want to solve technologically. And finding new materials or improving existing materials is really hard. And so um, in the materials uh, field, materials by design, this has been a buzzword. It has different names as it goes. We change the buzzword every time NSF and ONR get tired. Then we change the buzzword, and then they get excited about the same project with a different name. <laughs> so uh, it used to be called, uh, when I was a grad student, I think it was called quantum materials or quantum design or something. Anyway, materials by design is kind of a, what we call it now. But the idea is, is that you want to be able to say, I have a need, and you want to be, a, be able to design a material that meets that need. So you design the material. Instead of going out and discovering materials and then finding, you know, send, you know, you get Teflon and you're like, I can't get that to stick to anything. And then say, oh, but, you know, maybe that'll make a good frying pan then, right? 
we'd like to just design the material in the first place. So materials by design, that's kind of the holy grail of, of materials right now. And um, there's a number of different ways of thinking about it. Um, so th for those of you that aren't solid state physicists, I'll just say this is a band structure, and this represents maybe the property of a material, okay? And over here is a crystal structure, so that represents the material itself. So here's the material, and here's its properties. And what we used to do is we used to, you know, you know make a new material like Teflon in the lab and say, oh, I wonder what I could do with that. You measure the, the properties, and then you try to find an application. And so it's been kind of sexy lately to talk about inverse design and say we're going to start here and we're going to go this way. So we come up with the properties we want and then find the, find the material that matches that. We design the material that matches that. Um, and this is a little cheeky what I'm going to say next, but I'm going to argue that this materials by inverse design is a bad thing to do. Um, and that's a little cheeky because my former postdoc advisor has a, has a um, DOE funded center for doing this, but I don't think it's the right way to do it. So anyway, um, but along this, along this theme that I'm developing here of the importance of being able to find and discover and design new materials, the White House, about, it's been about two years now, came out with what they call the Materials Genome Initiative, which is another really fancy buzzword that probably is overstating things. But anyway, the idea is the biologists went out, found out about the genome, and they can do all kinds of gene stuff, and they can make, you know, rabbits that have ears that glow in the dark, okay? And they really did that, okay? And then you, you can make tobacco leaves that, you know, repel insects or whatever. So as a material scientist, we would like to discover what the genome is for materials. And then once we understood the genome, we could make our own materials. And so that's kind of this idea behind the Materials Genome Initiative. Anyway, that's kind of the latest sexy title we're giving um, to things that we want to get funded, okay? So anyway, so this is from the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology. But they're pushing this thing. Okay, so I'm going to make a silly analogy here first. So let's suppose that I'm trying to find um, the place to live that's going to make me the happiest. Okay? So the perfect place to live, that's what I'm after, okay? And here's what I just made up this list for myself. You might have a different list, but I want it to be safe and there to be good schools. These are not in necessarily a prioritized order. But anyway, I'd love a short commute, okay? Lots of high-tech jobs would be nice. Uh, low cost of living would be good. Uh, I'd like a really mild climate, okay? But I also want mountains nearby. I like the mountains around here. I'd also like it to be a rural community because I like it quiet. I'd like lots of cultural amenities. I'd like to, 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 there to be an orchestra, and my wife would love the opera, okay? And I want a community rec center real close by. Um, we recently had a bond that got defeated that was kind of unfortunate because we would have got a rec center. And I'm an avid handball player, so it would be nice if wherever I lived there were 30 or 40 people that were avidly involved in handball. Okay? So this is my perfect place to live. So all i got to do is go out and you know, pour through all of the cities in the United States and find the one that meets all those criteria. And then I'm happy, right? What's the problem with that approach? Uh, it doesn't exist. <laughs> it doesn't exist. So, you know, um, you know, the perfect place to live, it just doesn't exist. What you really have to do is the best place, and then you have to do some sort of a compromise. So I went and found the 10 most uh, desirable places to live as ranked by CNN Money. And um, what you find is that some of these places, like, uh, let's see, the one in Virginia, the median home co cost is over half a million dollars, right? So. So this kind of got struck out on the low cost of living thing here. And, you know, they're all kind of smallish, but I was hoping for something a little more rural. Anyway, it doesn't exist. That's the point, right? And that's the problem with this kind of, this kind of approach to materials by inverse design, is that you, you cook up the properties you want, and then the computer tells you what the material is. And it says, I want you to put a magnesium atom here and a magnesium atom there, and then gallium arsenide around it, and then put an atom here. And, Great, that would work, except for that doesn't exist. It's not thermodynamically stable. You could never make it in large quantities. It's just a dream. Just, so what we'd really rather do, so I'm going to argue that we're going to go back to the old-fashioned way. We're going to start with materials, and we're going to go sift through materials and see which ones have the desired properties. But what we're going to do differently about what we did before is instead of sorting through a few dozen or sorting maybe through a few hundred in some combinatorial fashion, we're going to... We're going to sort through hundreds of thousands of candidate materials, OK? 
okay, hundreds of thousands of candidate materials, and then sift through, sift through those to find the ones that are shooting for what we want. Okay, no one's interrupted me, and I'm really hitting a high clip here. So, um, all right, so this approach to making lots and lots and lots of calculations and then sifting through them in a smart way, we hope, to find uh, materials properties we want is something that we've kind of dubbed the high throughput approach. And we do this on a computer. We, we do this essentially by solving Schrodinger's equation for materials. And we do it over you know, every known crystal structure that you've ever seen in the literature and thousands more that we made up. I'll talk about that a little bit. And we stick every atom off the, on the periodic table in and out in all different combinations. And um, we've done this for essentially millions of different crystals so far. And we've got trillions to go. So we still have a lot of thinking about how to do this smart. But anyway, go ahead. There was a I question. How do you avoid the problem that you proposed earlier that you're creating impossible materials? So we, materials. we never put ours on a candidate list if they're not thermodynamically stable. And, and for a large part, we're only sifting through crystal structures that we've seen before in the literature, but perhaps with different atoms in them, or things that we made up that we think are reasonable. But it still might be impossible to manufacture these materials. They might be hard to manufacture, but if we know that they're thermodynamically stable, that's a good start. Um, the problem with this inverse design thing is it always invents stuff that, you know, like if it tells you that you're going to make cubic helium or something. Well, great. That might have cool properties. It, the minute you let go of it, though, it's going to go back to H, right? It's just going to go back to helium. And it, anyway, so yeah, so in some sense, that's that's always an issue. But we, we're, we're trying to be smart about that now. Well, you, you solved that problem. I mean, you, you study the, the crystal the stability. The, the yeah, so we know it's thermodynamic stability. Melting temperatures and yeah. stuff like that. So, so we, we try to sift. So we, we do hundreds. In the alloy, we've done like half a million so far. So some of the things that we do, we turn out not to be thermodynamic stable, but we eliminate those. We can't know a priori which ones are and which ones aren't. But then we look at the ones, and then we can sort through them as we go and only propose things that are reasonable. How sophisticated are you about that? About, about sorting through them? About being sure you've got thermodynamic stability and so on. Well, at, at first blush, we're just, we just kind of take a broad brush and we are, you know, just blunt strokes and then we cut off a lot of them and then we can get more refined as we go. When I finally go to, the, to, to my collaborators, say, in South Africa for, on platinum work, and I say, here's a good one, I've vetted it pretty well. i vetted it pretty well. And they found some, actually. So, um, and I'll talk about that just a little bit. Good interrupting. Anyway, so we wrote a review article on this uh, uh, last year about this new high throughput thing. And I'm going to give you an example of one from just the recent, uh, recent past year. So we did a long, we did a big search through platinum, uh, platinum compounds and platinum alloys because platinum uh, and platinum compounds are super important for catalysis. And catalysis is all the rage in renewable energy, and it's been around forever in the petroleum industry and the chemical industry. So we went and we, um, we did some, uh, we did a really comprehensive search on, on platinum group metal stuff with this approach. And I'm just going to kind of, here's a, 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 one of the figures from the paper. So what we've done here is on the top, I've listed every um, metal from the transition metal block on the periodic table. And on the side here, I've listed the six platinum group metals. And so if you go to, you know, niobium, rhodium or something, right? So you, it's a binary thing. So you say, I'm going to mix two together. And this diagram here, we, so we tried all of these. And that what the diagram is showing is in the green, those are places where our, our calculation said these form interesting compounds and experiment more or less agrees with us. And the great. Do you study only crystals, or do you study amorphous? Uh, uh, the short answer is we don't do amorphous. Okay, that's the short answer. That's um, my preference too. What? <laughs> well, we can we can have a longer discussion about that. We, uh, but anyway, the, the the gray ones are places where the theory says these phase separate, like oil and water. They don't mix, and experiment agrees. They don't mix. That's what the gray circles mean. So the circles mean they agree. And the red here are places where we found a system. If you mix those two metals together, we, found, we find thermodynamically stable states. 
and experiment has never seen them and says it's probably phase separating. So we find 28 new cases where um, we can make something that the experimentalists haven't seen yet. And there's also, also several... Is always binary one-to-one -one or, or...? No, it's any, we looked at every stoichiometry. But, 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 but a binary. Rational. Rational, yeah. Oh, okay. There's even a caveat there. We go a little bit... But anyway, so that's maybe a longer story. Um, the, the bottom thing you can kind of ignore for a second, but essentially um, it's, it has to do with how likely we are to find some of these. But I, I've never done this before, but I want to share with you some of the referee comments from this paper. Um, if I would have written them myself, I wouldn't have dared be so positive. But they make a point that I want to share with you. So when this paper was under review, it said, this is an example, this is a, one of the referees, this is an example of a paper that will remain relevant for the next two decades. That is the amount of time I expect experimental material science will need to examine all the suggestions re reported in this manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, I felt pretty cool. You know, and then I kept reading, and then the next paragraph, the computational literature, as well as other areas of science, suffers from a publication diarrhea, with many papers reporting incremental improvements. That makes it hard for readers to digest all this information and even forgetting to know which information exists and which is not. I can easily imagine that the information that is contained in this manuscript could have been published in 50 or more individual papers. <laughs> so it was no surprise to me when the editors of PRX came back and said, hey, we want to do a special viewpoint on your paper because these, these referee reports, both of them were just unbelievable. Um, anyway, so we landed a, a huge grant to do this kind of work over the next five years with the ONR. And I have funding for three postdocs and four PhD students. And uh, I've got five other collaborators who have a similar level of funding. And we're desperate for uh, help. And so I'm unabashedly recruiting or hoping that you'll give me a referral. I need, po I need PhD students and I need postdocs. No wonder you're willing to. Adjust, Adjust my schedule to come. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, 67 million years ago, the meteor came and wiped out everything that was bigger than a 20 kilogram uh, um, mammal. And I'm saying we're the 10 kilogram mammals in the, computer, in the computational material science field, and the meteor is coming. We're on the wave. We're on the right side of the, of the dividing line here. So, anyway, come join us. We're having a great time. Okay, so. Now, uh, material science lesson, I'll kind of show you some of, some of what we've been doing and where we're going. So here's platinum, um, three nines pure, one troy ounce here. For those of you that are not a solid state physicist, which is maybe most of you, which is fine. Here's a picture, if you could see in a microscope where the atoms live inside of platinum, this is what it looked like. So you have a cubic crystal structure. You have atoms at the corners of the cubes and on the faces, so we call that face-centered cubic, or FCC. And that's where the atoms sit inside of a piece of platinum. Now, why do I care about platinum? Uh, I care about platinum because, <laughs> this is embarrassing, but I have another funded project where I get paid to work with um, South Africa. This is an NSF funded project. Don't say this outside of this room. But we work on jewelry alloys, OK? Turns out economic impact is huge here, especially for South Africa, because they export 75% of the world's platinum, and they do it as a raw um, a raw material, and they'd love to export it as an alloy instead, as a value-added good, right? So um, anyway, here's a couple of platinum wedding bands. Let me, um, and the problem with wedding bands, so I've got this gold one here, and it scratches pretty easily, but if it was pure gold, it would scratch really easy. It's 14 karat gold, which means that it's less than half gold, right? Well, it depends on if you go by weight or by volume, anyway. But anyway, so you, you alloy the thing to make it harder so that it doesn't scratch. So how does that work? So this is a very cartoonish way of explaining it. So imagine there's my crystal, okay? And I know it's only in two dimensions, but anyway, so we have this kind of squarish lattice and very common uh, defect in metals is that there's an extra plane of atoms inserted in between two planes. And so you get this thing called a dislocation. If you have a very well annealed, that means heated and, heated and, and uh, made pure, a piece, a cubic centimeter of aluminum, it'll have a thousand kilometers of dislocation defects in it. So you imagine you take that little cubic centimeter and you unroll it till it's a thousand kilometers long. That's how many of these. So these dislocations are everywhere inside of a material, even a good 
a good, well-annealed material. Anyway, but what happens here is if I take this material and I shear it, so I, I push on the top and the bottom in opposite directions, what will happen, see, look at this extra plane of atoms here. So I've got a plane of atoms here. But what I can do is I can break this bond here, and then I can make a new plane of atoms there and move the dislocation over by one um, click in my lattice here. So then my dislocation's there. If I keep shearing the thing, the dislocation keeps moving. So you see the dislocation's moving to the left here. And it'll just keep moving over, okay? And it'll keep going. And eventually, it'll either get tangled up on something. And they're actually not nice straight lines, typically. They, they look more like threads through your material. But anyway, at the end, the dislocation can even find its way to the surface. It, you probably know, especially like with lead and things like that, metals tend to be ductile, right? If you hammer on them instead of shattering like a piece of glass, they tend to dent. So they're ductile. And this dislocation mobility is what makes them ductile, but it also is what makes them soft. Okay? And so what can you do to stop this dislocation motion? Well, you could throw in a little bit of some other atom, and the other atom is less likely to want to make that bond break. And so what happens is, is the dislocations get kind of caught on these, on these um, imposters, if you will. And um, that makes the material harder. So in this, in this um, jewelry alloy we're trying to work, we're trying to do, we're trying to add less than five weight percent of some atom and make the, the platinum harder. And we actually succeeded with copper not too long ago. I'll tell you the story here. So here's an a electron micrograph of a platinum alloy that's got uh, about 10% uh, by uh, 10 atomic percent copper in it. And you see there's these white areas in the micrograph, and then there's dark areas. The copper is not concentrated on the white areas. The copper is uniformly distributed throughout the platinum. But what happens is in the white areas, remember this, this face-centered cubic lattice I told you about? The, the copper atoms are sitting in very specific locations. They're ordered. Okay, they have an ordered arrangement inside of these white areas. And inside of the dark areas, they're just random still. About 5% of the volume of this sample has the coppers ordered. And in the rest of the sample, it's it disordered. What's the composition then when it's ordered? What's the ratio? It's, atomically, it's 7 to 1. Why? 7 to 1. Makes sense. So, so uh, now, those of you that aren't, they're just physicists like me, uh, you probably never heard of the micro-hardness test, but basically, I, I love material science. They take a diamond stylus, basically, and they stab the material, and they look how big a hole they made in the material. Okay? It's a very scientific thing that they do. <laughs> uh, actually, it's well calibrated. It works. And it's impossible to, uh, to model. But anyway, so all you've got to do here is I just want you to look at, at this uh, micro-hardness scale here. So here's an unannealed sample that doesn't have these nice little ordered pieces. And here's one where... Or as you heat it up, you start to form these, these white areas, these ordered areas. And when you, when you, it happen, the maximum happens around 200 C. If you stop there, you've almost doubled the hardness of the platinum. And all you did was add around 10% copper. And then heat it up just right. OK, so this is, this, this is the kind of thing that we'd like to be able to show the material scientists how to do. Platinum copper as a jewelry alloy has been in use for more than 100 years. And nobody knew why every once in a while the jeweler would get lucky and make a really hard alloy with a little bit of copper. But now we know that it's because you got to have just the right amount of copper, you got to squeeze the thing like crazy and introduce a whole bunch of defects, and then cook it just right at 200 C, and then you can double the hardness. Now we have the recipe, now, and now they can do it every time. Okay, so a take home message I'm talking really fast, and there's no questions. You're not going to interrupt me yet? Okay. All right. So um, what I want to point out is um, we have a problem here or an interesting physics concept here where where the atoms go on the lattice is kind of the important question, right? Because when they order in this way, okay, when they order in this way and I get these little regions where it's ordered, I double the hardness. So this is a question that comes up all the time in materials. We're just saying you've got yeah. little regions where it looks like that, but the, that whole thing is hard, right? The whole thing is hard, but what happens is the dislocations move through these little white areas, these little precipitates. They get that's the dislocations get stuck there, and so we've 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 uh, reduced the ductility, but increased the hardness. So I don't know if you can say it's it's hard like in this area and it's not hard there because remember they just poke it with a diamond stylus, right? And poke it with a smaller one. 
Yeah, they're not. Then it might still be soft in the gray, the, in the dark areas. Yeah, but but a material scientist or someone buying the jewelry doesn't care because they're not going to see a poke that small, right? So. Yeah, but we, we're, we're material we're, scientists. We're real scientists. I know, I know. Yeah, there's a question over here. That's the scale of the picture. I think oh, it's short of hitting there. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's that's your fault, not mine. Um, <laughs> let me jump ahead there. It's it's a hundred it's a hundred nanometers is what it is, but I'm. A hundred na nanometers. I don't know about three hundred. Three hundred atoms. Okay. Um, okay. Let's go. Okay. So, um, so let's just give an example. So I'll give you an example of kind of a materials problem. That, yes, please. So, so what did you do differently than other people? And did you just so, did you simulate? So the the key the key here, and it came both from the experimental side and the and the and the computational side, but the key is these copper atoms, they don't move around. If you just like take copper and platinum and mix them together, melted, and then you cool them down, you only get the dark stuff because the copper atoms can't move. So um, material scientists, you've got to love them. So what they do is they take the platinum and they run it through a roller, a double roller thing, and they just squeeze the heck out of it. They squeeze it to 10% of its original thickness, right? And what happens is you end up creating all kinds of defects in the lattice, basically places where atoms are missing. And then when you heat it up, those vacancies, those voids, are places where the platinum and the copper can dance, and they can switch places. And so you let them dance for a little while, and then they can do the ordering. But pretty soon, those vacancies find their way to the surface, or they get stuck, and then the dance is over. That's why you only get 5% of it actually ordering. So you have to introduce these broken pieces. So, so anyway, you've got to run the thing through the roller. You've got to heat it up just right. And that's something that we know both from the experimental and the theory side. OK, now follow up. Um, well, my question was just what is the procedure? What did you do differently? Uh, well, I mean, so I didn't do the experiment. I'm just a theorist. I don't really do the hard work. <laughs> yeah. So, so what I did, I guess I didn't make that clear. Uh, what I did was predict that seven to one thing. So it was kind of explanatory in, in why the thing worked. So this, this was what I predicted that this is thermodynamically stable. And so once you know that, you can say, OK, I'm going to take some platinum and then take some copper and I'm going to mix it together in those proportions. And then I'm going to see if I can do what the crazy theorist did. But and then if you had a whole big piece of this stuff, it still would be soft. No, it's it, a, mac a macroscopic piece is hard according to the micro hardness scale. So you can make jewelry out of this and it's way better. Oh, yeah. Let, let, let me cross check this one first. Yeah. So you say the stuff generally is ductile or soft because it has dislocations, right? These dislocation defects. Yeah. Now, if you can get the dislocation defects out, you will have this would be soft. I don't think you get them out. You just make it so they don't move. Right. So here yeah. you don't, you get them stuck. That's you get them stuck. Is, 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 right. You say hard. But if you had a perfect lattice of this, then it would be soft again because no dislocation, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it would be soft again if you could. Yeah, if you, especially if you could get all the dislocations out. But right, yeah. that's that's hard. Well, there is people grow semiconductors dislocation free, huge pieces of it. Yeah. And are those? Yeah, it's, it, it's cares. so it, tur it turns out that it's way easier to grow um, perfect crystals in the silicon industry than it is in any other industry, and it's just because of history and economics. Right. But I'll show you a picture in a minute where we're, where they grow perfect crystals in platinum. Or not in platinum, but in nickel aluminum, and it's really expensive. But anyway, so I'm I'm there in one slide. Okay, so here's a picture of a Liberty ship, a couple of Liberty ships. In World War One, these Liberty ships used to sail the oceans, and they used to um, break in half whenever it got cold. Not whenever, but sometimes they would break in half when it got cold. <laughs> and the reason is because the best steel of the day underwent a ductile to brittle transition at, at just around freezing. So if you sailed them in cold water, they'd get brittle. And if, they, if there was any swells in the ocean, then they, they'd snap. And um, in fact, some people have speculated that this was actually a, um, a factor in the, in the um, sinking of the Titanic. But, but that's very controversial. Anyway, so here's, here's another um, similar anecdote here. This is a, this is a turbine blade. 
for a jet engine or a, a piece of one. And, um, and I heard this thing once. I'm not really a material scientist, but I heard this thing from a material scientist, and I've repeated it so many times that now I'm sure it's true. <laughs> and the thing that I heard was that if you could make these turbine blades so that, um, so that you could run them one degree hotter, so that the engines were a little more efficient, you could save a billion liters of jet fuel every year globally. So there's a lot of money actually being poured, in, poured into these, these uh, turbine blade alloys. Uh, they're mostly made out of nickel aluminum. Um, I'm going to make a longer story short here, and I'm just going to say the, the thing that's in question, just like in the platinum that I showed you, is where do the atoms sit? That becomes a really important question. OK, so now what I want to do is I want to tell you a little bit of a story about how do we answer the question of where do the atoms sit? That's an important, and so, um, and I'm getting it's, it's this bird's eye view again. So I'm going to say that the way that we talk about the question where do the atoms sit is with something called the cluster expansion, okay? And it's a mathematical trick or a mathematical expansion. You know, if, you were a, if you're an experimentalist and you do uh, Raman spectroscopy or some sort of signal processing, you probably use Fourier series and you represent things as sines and cosines. So it's essentially that kind of an idea. We're going to take a crystal and we're going to represent it okay, in little clusters. And so the little clusters become the terms in our math, and there's coefficients in front of the terms. And if we get those coefficients right, then we can essentially take this sum and compute things really rapidly. But the problem is, is that you don't have any idea what the coefficients are. So it's cute math, but uh, it's kind of worthless by itself. So uh, here in, pic in pictures, here's the idea. We have a lattice, okay? We want to populate that lattice with atoms, okay, red and blue here. And we want to ask ourselves the question, um, is that the way the atoms would like to sit? Is that thermodynamically stable? Okay, and the way that we answer that question is to break up the crystal into these clusters and to do this mathematics here if somehow we could get the secret coefficients. Okay? And that's a business that I've been in for a while, and I'll talk more about it in a little bit. But it's really only useful if there's some way that you can essentially explore every possibility of how these atoms sit on a lattice. And one of the things I've really enjoyed about being a physicist and getting into this material stuff, especially the last five or six years, is I'm always learning really cool mathematics. It isn't really that hard, but this is new to me, and I'm easily entertained. So, um, so compressive sensing is some new mathematics that I'm going to tell you about at the end of the talk. But um, something I learned about a few years ago, years ago is I was trying to do this problem of enumerating all the possible ways that you could put atoms on a lattice. Well, there's an infinite number of them, right? But I wanted to enumerate them in some way that made sense. So, um, so here's an example. So I got all red, and then I got all green, and then I've got red and green and slices going horizontal, and then diagonal. And, and anyway, so a mathematician and I used some group theory that I got to learn that I didn't know and did some fun combinatorics and uh, got a few papers out. But anyway, we came up with an algorithm for generating these configurations. And I thought it was no big so and it would be useful for us. But it turns out everybody in the dog has been using this code to enumerate other kinds of things on a lattice and do all kinds of interesting, um, all kinds of interesting physics. And I love to tell that story, but I'm not going to tell that story because when I tell the story, everybody falls asleep because the math is kind of, you know, uh, foreign to you anyway. But there's this thing called the Hermite normal form from group theory and the Smith normal form. And we came up with this cool equation for m going mapping back and forth between two spaces. And if you really care, and probably nobody does but me, there's a paper about it that is really well written and easy to understand. Um, <laughs> anyway, but I won't tell you that story. But so we came up with this way of enumerating all of the possible ways of decorating a lattice. And I, I had this crazy idea. I said, let's go to a face-centered cubic lattice. Remember, that's the one from the platinum, right? OK, this cube with atoms on the faces as well. And I said, let's enumerate all possible ways of decorating an FCC lattice that where we, the repeating motif is either two atoms or three atoms or four atoms, but no more than that. And I enumerated them, and there's only 17 of them. There aren't any other in the universe. This is all of them that are possible from a mathematical point of view. And I said to myself, I said, um, Wait, are you doing this with two kinds of atoms? Two kinds of atoms. Okay. Two, red, and, red and blue. 
Yeah, very creative. Yeah, I mean, you can tell I'm a theorist. My periodic table has two atoms on it and sometimes a third one, right? Red, blue, and sometimes yellow. Um, all right, so then I, I enumerated these 17, and I went to the literature, and I said, how many of these crystal structures actually exist in the literature? And I found some right off the bat, so I marked those. And then there were a couple more which some theorists had said should be thermodynamically stable, and so they had predicted some more. So there was these, there was these five crystal structures that are really simple, they're either two, three, or four atoms or less, but the repeating unit, right? And nature's never used them. And I said, oh, that's cool. Why would nature not use them? So I conceived of this paper, the title first, um, and it's the coolest title ever to appear in a journal. Where are nature's missing structures? And I realized in hindsight I should have submitted it to science, and then it would have been really cute. But anyway, so where are nature's missing structures? Uh, anyway, so... So this was really fun. So I went to, I came, I'm making a long story short here, but I looked at these structures and I came up with a metric for them. And I said, if you just throw atoms down at random, okay, how closely do these, do my 17 structures approximate randomness? And the ones which have never appeared, they're the ones that are more random. Okay, and the ones that are highly unrandom are the ones that we see in Experiment and the ones in the middle that the theorists had predicted, okay, they're kind of middle of the road. So these ones are probably harder to do thermodynamically. And uh, very, very interestingly, this one called cadmium platinum three by somebody else. This structure right here, never been seen before. Uh, Lauren and Casey, raise your hands. Lauren and Casey were my undergraduate students at BYU a couple years ago, and we just submitted a paper in December where we've seen that one in TEM now. We made it in platinum and copper, actually, rather than in platinum and cadmium. I, we played around with cadmium, cadmium, cadmium for a while, but it should be just banned. It forms oxides, and it's poisonous, and the experimentalists hate it. So anyway, we did it with copper anyway. So this one we've actually seen now. Anyway, so this was... What do you do to make it crystallize like that? Yeah. You heat it up, you mix it together, you cool it down, you run it through the big roller, okay, okay. <laughs> you cook it again, and then you slice it, anyway. Yeah. And then you reverse the process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's this cute little mathematics that lets us quickly um, predict the energy of a structure. Now, okay, so now we're going to start to be more and more mathy. I've shown a lot of pictures. Can I ask you a question? Uh, please. List of probabilities. Yeah. Why does an A2B2 exist? Or this one right here? Doesn't it seem likely that that would be a good candidate to go look for something? My guess is that it, it does exist, but the experimentalists haven't seen it yet. You know, it's frustrating. I predict things like almost every day, and every time I go to experimentalists, they say it's going to take me two years to figure that out. You know, I just wish they they could go faster. This platinum copper that Lauren Casey and I did, we had the we had the calculations done like two years ago, and it took forever for the experimentalists to. I guess experiments hard. It's a good thing I became a theorist because I I don't think I could do it. Uh, yeah. Why was MOPT two in 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 brackets there? Um. It's, it's the name. So I put the, let's see, I'm trying to remember. It, it, so it's just an alloy thing. So they, they have these names that are called structobricts. If I listed it by the structobricta, I just listed it. If I just listed it by the compound in which it appears, I put it in parentheses. And so? So Molly Platinum 2, I don't think it has a, a structobrict designation. So I put it in parentheses. And so do you know why is this one? I mean, it's why this one forms and not that one? Well, yeah, so pretty much that's... <laughs> is there something to these molecules, same size, or uh, uh, more atoms? Uh, well... <sighs> I guess what I'm going to say, this is going to sound a little bit defensive, and I apologize, but what you got to understand is when I made this metric up, there was no physics in it at all. It was based only on probabilities. So it's a rough, it's a rough measure. But what it gives us is kind of some understanding of, you know, why is it that nature's chosen some structures over others? It's a, just a broad explanation, but it's not, it's not really that strict. Okay, so some math here. Um, I told you about this expansion that we had where we could do these lattice models really fast. And I just, I just want to tell you that if, if you go to this map, there's some two-body terms and some three-body terms and some four-body terms and so on and so forth. And some of them are longer than others. Like this three-body term is bigger than that three-body term, right? It's bigger, smaller kind of thing. So I made a plot 
of kind of size on this axis versus number of clusters at that distance. So, so if you look here, the, I should have labeled these, I'm sorry. The yellow ones are the four bodies. So these are pairs, triplets, four bodies, five bodies. So if I go out just one lattice parameter, that's like from here to here on the lattice, I go out one lattice parameter, I've already got hundreds and hundreds of four body terms. Okay? If I go to five bodies, I have thousands of terms. So imagine I decide to truncate my expansion, say at you know, one, one and a half lattice parameters or something. Then I've already got a model that has 10,000 parameters in it. Okay? And if you're in the business of fitting models and I say 10,000 parameters, you should just run screaming from the room. Because it's a really hard, hard problem. Are you doing only metals? We, well, we do more than metals, but today's talk is metals. Because I'm kind of limiting my scope so I can tell a coherent story. <laughs> <laughs> but we do way more, yeah. Um, that, that, that publication I showed at the very beginning is mostly non-metals, and you could go look at that if you wanted to. I mean, but there's lots of, lots, I mean you're, I'm really interested, you you got to get the interaction terms between atoms on different lattice sites. Yeah, we can do that, actually. We can do that. We can do that. But I'm just not showing that here. And we, we can do that, and we've done it. But I'm just not telling that story here. So the say you call lambda, is that an energy? It could be an energy. I've done bulk moduli. I've done shear moduli. We can, I've done band gaps. It's just any physical observable. Do you do free energy also? <laughs> oh, I would, I would pay a lot of money to be able to do free energy. Yeah. Free ener if I could get the, the entropy, and that's, what, that's one of the pushes we're doing right now, is to try to get entropy. Um, the undergraduates will believe me if they're in the thermal class. Entropy's hard. Yeah, <laughs> entropy's hard. Okay, so I have a model. It's got 10,000 parameters in it. You did entropy in, those, in the, that calculation you showed us before, the probability of a random... In some sense, it was implicit in there, right? Because I said I had this randomness metric. Yeah, yeah so somehow it's in there some way. Or at least I'll claim that it is, and then I look like I'm smart or something. But anyway, we had this 10,000 term Hamiltonian that we were trying to truncate. And in 2005, um, my buddy Folker and I came up with this grand idea of thinking of the list of terms as a gene. And then and genetic algorithms had already been invented, so I'm not going to take credit for that. Anyway, we decided to apply genetic algorithms to this problem. And we got a lot of traction in the community, um, got a lot of excitement, and um, got published in Nature Materials again. Anyway, it was really, really fun. Um, and uh, this until about a year ago was, I would say, state-of-the-art in these lattice models. And we just put ourselves out of business with something way better. And that's what I want to tell you about now. That's the end of my talk. Oh, <coughs> I, do we end at 10 till? Tell me when we end. Honestly, when do we normally when end? You no? shut up, then. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to know how to time myself. OK, so I want to do something. I need something better than what I just showed you. I need something much better, because I'm doing this high throughput thing now. I want to, you know, it used to be that I'd spend uh, three or four months and I'd make one of these cluster expansion models and we'd publish a paper on platinum copper. And that would take us a while. But I don't want to do that anymore. I want to make models for a thousand things and I want to do it all at once. And if I'm going to do that, I've got to have a way to make these models automatically. I've got to make them more accurate and they've got to be totally hands off. They've just got to work on their own. So I need something hands free, robust. And compressive sensing is going to get me there. If you haven't heard of co compressive sensing, it's this cool mathematics that the signal <laughs> processing people discovered that basically they cheat the shannon nyquist theorem, the thing that says that if you're doing a Fourier transform, you have to go up to some cutoff frequency. They basically said that theorem's true in principle, but in practice we can ignore it all the time. And here's the math that says we can. Is this like MP3? <laughs> I don't know what MP3. Oh, yeah. It's kind of like MP3. Yeah, it's a compression idea. Yeah. OK, so here's what, here's, here's what we did. We said, we're going to pretend that materials physics, so imagine you have a signal, right? You have a time signal, right, that goes up and down in time, OK? And you can take that signal, and the signal processing people have showed us how to compress that into an MP3 or something, right? Compress that, or recover the signal if we're measuring it really, really efficiently. So we're going to pretend that, that there's some function that wiggles, 
and that the domain of it, so that the crystal structure, is the time axis. So I'm going to take this idea of a graph that wiggles along a time axis, and I'm going to expand that to, like, say, 3,000 dimensions. And then I'm going to say the thing that I'm measuring is some crystal property, some property of a material. And then once I've done that, I've conceptually reconnected it to a signal. Now it's just a signal. I'm going to pretend like it's a signal. And I'm going to steal, lock, stock, and barrel, all of the cool math ideas from the signal processing community, and then I don't have to do anything because they already figured it out for me. That's what I'm going to do. And so that's what we did. So in physics, I remember as an undergraduate, this is what we always did. We, you stated a problem. It was too hard. And so what did you do? You threw away all the terms except for the quadratic one and the ones that maybe the ones that are smaller than that. And you did the harmonic oscillator, right? And then if it was like advanced mechanics, then maybe you added the cubic term or the quartic term, okay? And then, boy, at that point, you just said, oh, I'm, I'm too tired. I can't go any further, right? So what we did is we got trained to build simple models and make them slightly more complicated so that they matched our data. So with this compressive sensing, I'm going to go completely backwards. And instead of making my model more and more complicated, I'm going to start with an infinite number of models that are all consistent with my data. And I'm going to throw all of them away but one. And the one I'm going to keep is the best one, the simplest one. That's what compressive sensing allows me to do. So it's totally backwards. Okay? So here's a, here's a model. Here's, and I measure, okay, let's see. So here's, a, I'm going to skip ahead here for just, well, let's, let's look at that picture right here. So here's a signal that I don't know. I measured a few times. I do a Fourier decomposition. I get some Fourier spectrum that looks kind of like that. And then maybe what I do is I keep only the top four or five terms and I throw the rest away and then I get a close approximation. Okay? Um, so anyway, if I did this the normal way, I'd have some sines or cosines or both, right? And I'd write down some sort of an expansion like this. And then I would evaluate the basis functions at, different, at all the different places on the axis where I evaluated my function. And I would make this system of linear equations. This should be boring to those of you that have made it through, say, uh, mathematical physics or something, right? Because this is just essentially what you do when you expand in an infinite basis, right? Anyway, so this reduces to a linear algebra problem where I have a matrix of numbers, I have a column of unknown coefficients, and then I have some data over here that I measure. And so all I have to do, essentially, let me rewrite this. So I have a y equals ax problem. I don't know what x is, so I take the inverse of a, and then I get x. Bada bing. Simple, right? And the problem with this is that According to Shannon Nyquist, you have to sample at twice the rate of the frequency that you're trying to recover, the highest one. And if you want to do really efficient inverses, you've got to sample regularly. And the number of samples you take has to be like a, you know, a high order power of two or maybe three. Right? You've got to have prime numbers in there. But this might not always be easy to do. I mean, if you've got a Mars rover that's sending data back up sometimes to the orbiter, right? It might, not, it might miss data, or it might be able to not measure on a regular interval. So this is not always a good thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to do something different. We're going to measure randomly, not at uniform intervals. And we're going to measure just a few times. And we're going to do the same problem again, OK? But now we have a problem mathematically. If I sample only a few times and I include thousands of functions in my Fourier expansion, then what happens to this matrix here is it's not square. It's a big rectangle with lots of columns and only a few rows. Okay? So now I get a problem here where I've got this rectangular matrix, some unknown column vector, and then a little bit of data. What's the problem mathematically with this, with this setup? Does it have a solution? It has an infinite number of solutions. That's the problem with it. I don't know which one I want. So I'm going to cheat. Okay, This is what I learned from the signal processing people. Instead, I'm going to say, let's take the A, the solution vector, with the most zeros in it. Okay. In fact, let's make it as if we add up all of the components of that vector, let's make sure that all the components add up to be the smallest possible thing. That's what I mean by minimize with this little one here. Okay, I'm going to minimize A with respect to this one. I'll talk about that in a second. But subject to the conditions that it still solves the original problem. I mean, I could pick the zero vector, and then it's really small, okay, but that doesn't solve my problem. Okay? So it's got to be subject to the fact that it still <coughs> fixes my problem. Okay, so I introduced this little silly one here. The one means that I'm going to take the solution vector, which I'm now confusingly calling U instead of A. I learned this from the mathematicians. OK? 
Okay, change the variables frequently. Okay, so I take my vector u here, and if I add together the absolute values of all the components and I add those together, I call that the L1 norm. And now you've seen the L2 norm before. The L2 norm is where you take the squares and then you add them together and then you take the square root. Right? That's the thing that you least squares kind of thing. That you, okay? This is the same thing except for I take the I don't square it. I raise it to the first power. I add them all together, and then I take the first root. Okay, if taking the first root's easy, right? That's a physicist can even do that. Okay. All right. So you might be wondering why this. Who cares? Why does this work? Well, I'm about to tell you. Okay. Um, this this is this is the essence of compressed sensing, and the reason that it works so well, and you don't know the reason yet, but I'm going to tell you the reason that it's practical is because lots of really smart signal processing related mathematicians figured out all kinds of numerical algorithms for enforcing that minimization problem that I just told you about. So again, I don't have to invent anything on my own. I don't have to be creative or smart. I just steal it from them, and I can. So you're saying you're, you've got other minimization criteria other than just making this no I just want to make this small that's all I'm doing that's subject okay. to the constraint that it still solves the problem sure. okay all okay. well, right so let's talk about this L1 thing a little bit more so here is a space where my solution lives in so I've got a I've got a two-dimensional space here's a candidate solution okay so if I measure how far it is from the origin okay as the crow flies that's an L2 norm and so how big is this norm here this is two this way and two that way, so the distance is square root of eight. Or if you're really adept at math, it's two root two. But I just said square root of eight. My students pointed out it had another form. Okay, if I go here, then that's square root of 10. Right, I just take this side, three squared plus one squared, add that together, nine, squ you know, nine plus one, square root of 10. This is square root of 10, right? But you're doing this in a multi-dimensional space. I'm doing this in, yeah, 3,000 dimensions, but. Okay, so now let's look at this with the L1 norm. The L1 norm, I just say, if I'm walking around in Manhattan, how many blocks do I have to walk to to get to that point? So I walk two blocks this way and two blocks that way. So this has a norm, an L1 norm of four. Okay? And if I go this way, three blocks this way, one block that way, that also has a norm of four. So these two things are the same distance away, according to the L1 norm. Okay? All right, so why do I care? This is the last important slide, I guess. But I can show you one more after this. I know that you're about out of juice here. But so try to stay engaged for three more minutes. So so let's imagine that you have a you know this two-dimensional solution space. This orange line, okay, is the line of all your solutions. Remember, we have an underdetermined problem. There's an infinity of solutions. Pretend for a moment that all the solutions lie on that line. Okay? So if I'm using the L2 norm to find the smallest solution, I'd pick the one where this so-called L2 ball intersects with the or orange line, and that's right here. Now that solution has some x component to it and some y component to it, right? So it's a dense solution in the sense that it has, co it has weight in both of the dimensions in my solution space. But if I draw this so-called, the mathematicians, you've got to love them, this blue thing, they call that the L1 ball. <laughs> Don't you love that? Okay, this is the this is the surface of equal of equal L1 norms. Okay, now if you look at where the L1 ball crosses this orange line, it actually crosses where it has weight in y but no weight in x. Right. So this is a solution that has no x component, only a y component. So this is a solution where you have one less parameter in your model. Right. So this whole L1 norm business, what it does is it takes this infinite number of solutions and it finds the one that has loads of zeros in it. Okay? That's the one that says, is saying very little about the physics. It's saying it has the least physics in it that you can put in there and still solve the problem. Okay. Is it also numerically the easiest one to find? Okay. The dirty little secret is this actually isn't the best one, but this numerically really easy to find, and it's close to the one that we want to find. But if you want to ask more about that, you have to wait until everybody claps, and they all run off, okay? Because they're about out of juice. So I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump right to the end here and say we used this idea on um, on this cluster expansion I've been talking about, and this thing I got all kinds of of traction in the literature with. This thing right here, these are my solutions using the genetic algorithm. The y-axis is the error in my model. And the red here is this new compressive sensing approach. 
So if you can look at this, you can see that the compressive sensing has much better error than the state-of-the-art genetic algorithm. Okay? The other thing that's important is it took me days to do each one of these runs. And these runs right here took seconds. And each one of these data points is a 1,000 fits. So it's like thousands of times faster, and the error bars are smaller. And the other cool thing is, so this looks, it's, it's scary looking math notation. Read the y axis as number of parameters in my model. Okay? So the genetic algorithm gets hundreds of parameters in my model. Okay? And the, okay? And the compressive sensing has very, very, very sparse models. Okay? Very small numbers of coefficients. So it just works like gangbusters. Are there any meaning to the coefficients? Uh, that's something I'd like to discuss offline as well, because I'm about out of time. But anyway, so it's faster, it gets better predictions, it's easier to implement. There's no adjustable parameters. It's 100% automatic. You hit the button, boom, out come your models. No parameters to twiddle. No, you know, with the genetic algorithm, there was like, how big is my population and what's my mutation rate and how do things mate and all kinds of stuff. But you usually have a term for controlling the L1, right? So you have an optimization with some constraint, and what you do, you, you write it in Lagrangian form, right? For solving. Uh, the, uh, the short answer is we can do it without an adjustable parameter. But if you know something about L1, then maybe we should talk in five minutes, and I can tell you the de dirty little details. Okay? But but essentially, the answer is essentially we do it without any adjustable parameters. Okay, now. I'm coming from signal processing. Okay, well, it, uh, okay. Um, the solutions are more physical because I have far fewer parameters. And I didn't say this, but we do this in a Bayesian framework, and so we get error estimates on our predictions. So it works fantastic. Um, I know that I talked fast and said lots of stuff. Um, but anyway, I need your help. <laughs> so send people my way. Thank you very much. Questions? <laughs> Hopefully you exhausted them all already. You were going to tell us about the meaning of your parameters, if they had any meaning. I think the parameters have meaning, meaning, but as a physicist, and I said this in my abstract, as a physicist, if I had a model with more than about three parameters, it's kind of beyond my physical intuition. And our best alloy models now with compressive sensing are ending with say 20 or 30 parameters, which is far fewer than the, the genetic algorithm would find, but far more than any mere mortal can assign some sort of physical intuition to, I would say. Now, and can, you, can you transfer those over onto another mixture of atoms? We think so, yes. But we need enough of them that we can, that we can interpolate in a way that makes sense. That's one of the things.